the important thing is um, that observable effects are proportional to energy release, energy loss of particle. The bigger energy loss, the more clear signal we observe. And that is characterized by dE over dx, the energy loss on the unit of, uh, of trajectory of particle. And we usually measure this in MeVs over centimeters. So the question is, suppose we have some particle, it can be electron or proton, and it propagates in medium. Of course, it can be absorbed immediately. Uh, but it can propagate and uh, lose the energy by small portions. So what are these energy losses, which you know? So what are processes? So what happens with electron and proton when they enter medium? Tell me. Who knows what? What are energy losses? So what's going on? Scattering, yes, so. Well, if you have scattering, uh, oh yes, you produce some recoil, but suppose recoil is small, it's usually we are at lower energies. So there are several processes. One is radiation energy loss. So, so to say, particle moves uh, in the environment of other particles, it changes trajectory, scatters, and emit photons. And then you really have an energy loss when, when you emit a photon. So another important process is ionization. you have some processes related to strong interactions. When your like proton, for instance, it interacts with nuclei, uh, and uh, it can be absorbed. So it's strong interactions. The strong interactions are uh, short range interactions. And uh, uh, to a large extent, those produced by electromagnetic interactions are dominated. So there is a process which is not dominant in terms of energy loss, but extremely important for detection of particles. And this is Cherenkov radiation. smaller than percent of total energy loss, uh, but uh, it's very uh, convenient for observations of particles, and in particular to see how, what are the tracks of particles. Now, I will discuss radiation energy loss today, then I will attach questions of coherence which are important in many respects and for many other uh, uh, items in our program. And finally, I will discuss ionization. So what is radiation energy loss? No, I have forgotten to oh, you switch. <laughs> Thanks. So. Radiation energy loss. For well, the particle, let me denote it by L in uh, the electromagnetic field produced by other particles in the medium. 
So let me put here atoms. And schematically the process looks like I show, I'm showing here. Emits the photon. So this is uh, again Feynman diagram for such a process. But the idea is that uh, uh, you have some interactions with atoms, which means with electrons and with nuclei, and the particle, and L can be electron or muon or some other heavy proton, other particles, and it emits photon. And here exchange by photon, which is electromagnetic interaction. Okay? So the reaction can be written as, let me put L plus ZA, charge and atomic number of nuclei. And in final state we have L, again the same nuclei, plus gamma, plus four. So, in our goal is to find dE over dx, energy loss on the unit of, uh, of length. So, um, let us compute this integral energy loss, because uh, uh, photons emitted here may have different energies in different collisions. And uh, so, let us consider integral over all possible energies of, of photons emitted in final state. So, making integration. Over energies of gammas in final state. And then, uh, Essentially, we have just one characteristic, which is energy of incoming particle. And so the energy loss, one can guess, is proportional to E. Again, you see, of course, one can, one should do uh, uh, computations from the first principles, but uh, I will again derive uh, various formulas using dimensional arguments, uh, symmetries, etc. So, again, after integration over final energy, final state, the only energy unit is uh, E, of the energy of incoming particle. And so one can guess that uh, this is proportional to energy. Now, to keep the units, we need to put here L, some distance. So, since we have energy loss, we should put here minus sign. And let me put here LR. And this is what is called a radiation length. If LR doesn't depend on energy, Integration of this uh, equation is trivial, and we get that E equals E0, exponent minus x over LR, right? So we just divide by E here, and then here is dx, and the integration is trivial. So uh, under such a condition, particle loses the energy exponentially with distance, and LR has the sense as a distance over which the energy reduces by factor 2.7 by E, right? So energy reduces by factor 2.7. Now let's see how we can compute the radiation lengths. We can write an uh, expression for energy loss in a uh, slightly different form. So dE 
over dx equals the average energy of, uh, of gamma in the process of emission multiplied by number of collisions on the unit of, of length, which is given by cross-section, and uh, number of scatters, number of atoms. Okay? So which means this is energy loss in a single collision, in average, and this is number of collisions on the unit of distance. And this is precisely what we are going to compute. So this average energy of photon is proportional to uh, total energy of energy of incoming particle. And therefore, 1 over LR, and essentially this is, uh, this is 1 over LR, is given by sigma multiplied by n. Now let me put here atoms. Now, okay, so let's keep number of scatters. So, that can be also treated as probability of collision on the unit of length. So let me give expression for this uh, sigma n or 1 over L r and then I will discuss uh, what are factors which enter this expression. And using field theory, you can, of course, compute this from the first principles. Um, sigma times n equals 4 alpha cube, and this is fine structure coupling constant, over the mass of particle which our particle which scatters squared, then the factor z, z plus 1, and this is electric charge of atom or nuclei. And then some relativistic factor, which is logarithm, 1, 8, 3, and here is z, 1 over third. And, and then multiply it by n number of atoms. So this is so-called screening factor and log, sorry. So this is what is called screening factor. But most important factors are here in front of this logarithm. Actually, this formula is valid for momenta transfer or energy, if you want, of, of, of particle, wavelengths of particle, inverse, or wavelengths in our, in our case. It's from 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 8 something which would correspond to momentum from, say, keV to 0.1 GeV. So this is important range for many observations. So outside of this range, the formula should be uh, modified. So I can give you kind of a, a physics derivation of, of this formula, which uh, uh, at least uh, uh, allows to understand dependence uh, of, uh, of this uh, sigma n on, on different parameters. 
I mean, just so. So let me first notice that there is no energy dependence here, so that our assumption that all LR uh, doesn't depend on energy uh, is confirmed by this expression. So LR, in fact, doesn't depend on energy. Now, there is a factor alpha square, alpha cube, sorry, which originates from the fact that we have the process of the third order, right? Here we have a, a photon here, we have photon interaction here, and photon here. So there are three vertices, right? Three elementary interactions involved here. Each of them produce factor E. And then when we, when we compute probability, we square this, and therefore we have this uh, uh, e to the sixth power, or alpha, which is, uh, uh, is e squared over 4 pi. Uh, then we have alpha to the, to the cube. Now, what is this factor? I will discuss in details uh, its appearance a little bit later, but let me now just tell you what is this. This is z squared plus z, and this comes from coherent scattering on protons in nuclei. This comes from incoherent scattering on electrons. Okay? So then multiply it by n a, let me see put here a, it gives us a complete number of total number of scatterers in, uh, in this unit uh, of, the, of the distance. And you see coherent scattering leads to square of the number of scatterers, whereas incoherent just proportional to the number of scatterers. And again, I will discuss this uh, in details later. Finally, important factor is here. So this is what you really need to, to remember. You may not remember some numerical coefficients, but these factors, uh, you. If you want to know physics, you need to understand. One over the mass squared, which is important. So this means that the lighter the particle, the more it loses the energy. The heavier particle, so the energy loss is small. Okay? Energy loss is inversion, inversely proportional to the mass of the particle squared. So let me uh, explain this. In a classical example, what we have, we have propagation of charged particle, and it emits if it moves with acceleration, right? So, or deceleration, right? So, but it should change the speed. So, in the field of other particles, like in our case, this is electron or proton inside the nuclei, particle change the direction, accelerate, or accelerate, and then emit radiation. So the force which acts or on our particle is given by E square and the radius square. So this is the force, sorry. And therefore the acceleration is given by so F over ML, and this is given by E square, R square, and ML. So ML appears in, in the denominator. So in classical physics, we have also this type of, of radiation, 
which is inversely proportional to the mass of the particle. Right? So the lighter the particle, the easier it accelerates and accelerates, and therefore easy emits the light. When we go from classical to quantum situation, we usually square what we have in classical uh, uh, case, and therefore our cross section is proportional to one over the mass of the particle squared. It's like when we compute in quantum physics, we square the amplitude. So I have no strict proof of this, but this is kind of intuitively what's going on. So this factor is, uh, it has the same nature as in classical physics. It's uh, because the lighter particle has an uh, easy way to accelerate or change uh, speed in the same field, and therefore easily, more easy uh, to emit the photons. Okay, so now let me, yeah, I hope I haven't forgotten this. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll just add one example before I will move to coherence to explain uh, this z squared z. So according to this formula, the heavier element we use, for instance, lead, medium made of lead or, or iron, the bigger acceleration because z increases, right? So d e over d x increases if we use heavier medium and lighter particles, right? So particles, the lighter the particle, the more uh, energy loss. For instance, if you take lead, in lead, radiation lengths for electron is 0.56 centimeters. So this gives you an idea. If you want to protect yourself from the flux of, uh, of electrons, um, then say one centimeter of lead is enough because in this case uh, the energy loss will be at least factor of 10. So it's 0.56 centimeters width of the lead is enough to decrease the energy of electron by factor 2.7. Yeah. Radiation loss enough to decide uh, how penetrating a particle is? We will come to this later. So we will discuss particular discoveries. We are using actually this uh, energy loss to identify what, what is what is this part, what particle actually penetrates. I will, I will, so that will be. Uh, for example, can we compare alpha particle with electron using just this radiation length? Well, uh, uh, so again, you have two factors. For this z, yeah, so that, that will be enough. Right? Because that essentially gives you information if everything else is fixed about the mass. So precisely this is how we use also to measure the, the, the masses of the particles. But you need also to establish that this is radiation energy loss. Because it may be ionization energy loss, but you should be sure that this is due to radiation. Or maybe some other energy loss. So let me come to the issue of coherence. And again, as I said, this is very general, and uh, we, we meet this uh, coherence issue continuously in all the parts of the, of the course. And in particle physics, you always deal with this kind of coherence. So I'm discussing here in connection to this feature. Suppose we have n scatterers in some volume of the size d.
And we have some body color wave with wavelengths, certain wavelengths, this is the size, which actually uh, scatters on the scatters, and we see the effect of scattering at some distance x, which is, say, much bigger than t. Right, so I have scatters here. I, J, for instance, etc. So, what is the probability or the signal here? And the probability is given by the sum of the amplitudes of scattering on individual scatters, sum from 1 to n, moduli squared. Right? So this we compute amplitude of scattering on individual scatter and then sum up over waves and scattered waves uh, uh, from each of the scatter. Is moduli inside or outside? The moduli is outside. So first you sum up the amplitude. This is this is crucial point. And then moduli, uh, uh, compute moduli square. So it's like adding waves. Uh, adding base, and now we, you will see when it reduces to something else at some time. So that can be open, and we will get two parts. One is what we call incoherent, oh, yeah, so I n moduli square, plus interference term. So that's uh, the rest because we compute this the sum and then there are kind of cross terms here plus two sum i j say i bigger than j not to repeat the same contribution uh, the sum and here's i amplitude j and then cosine f i minus fj, where uh, phases are the phases of, uh, of our amplitudes, since I have, uh, have taken here the, the moduli, so these are the phases, and we have, if we have propagation of free particles here, these phases are given by momentum of particle multiplied by, by uh, the length of trajectory for a given particle. So if you take your i, so that's xi, so that's xi. So let me just for simplicity, of course it can be even different p for different, uh, in different, for different ways, for, but for simplicity I will just consider that uh, the, uh, the scattering has the same p. Actually, this is more or less correct if I'm kind of far, so therefore, initial particle has, uh, has uh, uh, a unique momentum, so you expect that they are quite close to each other. However, in general, one needs also to put index i here. Now, it's clear? So, essentially, I, uh, we are considering plane waves secondary plane waves emitted by each of this of this scatter. Now the phase difference which enter cosine fi minus fj equals two pi over lambda and I put instead of p two pi over lambda and this is the Broid wave, xi minus xj. Okay? So now let us consider two different situations. First, when um, d is much smaller than lambda, which means that the size of our object where we have the scatterers 
is much smaller than the wavelengths of incoming particle and the wavelengths of uh, scattered particles. So we have wavelengths of this big size, much bigger. This is not. So the difference of this xi minus xj is smaller or equal d, right? Because uh, the difference of, of these trajectories for the particles which are sitting in this uh, volume d, and also d is here, huh, is smaller than d, right? And therefore, this difference is, much, uh, is smaller than d. So now if D is smaller than lambda, much smaller, then delta F is much smaller than 1. Okay. So this is much smaller than lambda, and therefore this is much smaller than 1. So the phase is small, and therefore these cosines of delta F are approximately 1 because this is zero, close to zero, small, so that's uh, all of the one. So if this is one, then the expression for P can be rewritten as motto, uh, as uh, sum of uh, A moduli I and then square. Right, so without this cosine, you again can collect everything in, in, in the sum square. And again, let me for simplicity assume that all these amplitudes moduli square are approximately equal to the same quantity. Then this will give me n square multiplied by a square. So we refer to this case as to the case of coherence. This is incoherent part. When we sum up moduli squared of the amplitude, this is interference. And uh, if this cosine is is zero or cosine for all difference differences here is the same, then you will get similar question. But but in our case, what is important that uh, uh, is that uh, this phase difference is small, and therefore cosine is one, and then you can collect back its to, to moduli. But now the difference is that here we have without moduli, and therefore different amplitudes may have different signs or different phases, and therefore they can kind of uh, interfere uh, destructively. Uh, if, however, uh, this uh, cosine is one, then what we will get, similar expression, however, now we are summing up the amplitudes, uh, uh, modulized of amplitudes, and therefore there is no uh, cancellation between them. They, they are adding coherently, and so we get this uh, effect answer. Now, another situa second situation is opposite. When um, D is, when wavelengths, sorry, wavelengths, the second is wavelengths is much smaller than D. So this is the first. And the second is when lambda is much smaller. Then delta phi can be much bigger than one. And therefore, different terms with this cosine make a different signs, and, uh, uh, and uh, so they, uh, in general, cancel each other. So if you have uh, here, say, uniform distribution, you should just make integration or averaging of this cosine over this volume, okay? which essentially strongly suppresses this cosine. Clear? So we'll have terms where these phases will have uh, bigger than so one quantity values, and therefore different cosines for different i and j 
you have different signs and different values. So, this cosine delta f average is close to zero. So then this term is suppressed, and what we will get for p is just this one. And again, if for all moduli a are the same, you will get n multiplied by a moduli squared. So this is incoherent case, which corresponds to small wavelengths in comparison with the size of our object, and in particular, distance between different scatterers. Okay. So physically, this means that with small wavelengths, we can resolve these structures. And essentially, scattering on each of these elements will be independent. And therefore, final answer is just given by the amplitude on a single scatter uh, multiplied by the number of scatterers. In the case of coherence, we have n squared. So we have this enhancement by additional mm, factor n in this case. Uh, oh, so this is this is the probability. Sorry, that's this is. Uh, I don't know, this probability is too many here. Let me put this big, right, big. And also this is big. For momentum I use small, so let me put here bigger. And as well as here. Okay. Can you say that we have uh, a bigger probability in the, um, in the case where d is smaller than lambda because in this case there's an uh, 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 interference and it's cancel each other so it's 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 uh, lower the amplitude or lower the yeah so in one case we have destructive interference which actually essentially uh, remove this interference term. In another case, we have constructive interference where the waves emitted from each of the of, uh, of the of the scatters sum up with the same phase. So, which means that you have this enhancement. Yeah. So we have both of them, constructive and destructive. But no, it depends on lambda. Uh -huh. So, so the point is that if you have big lambda. Then you have uh, uh, constructive interference, and you have this coherent enhancement of, of the effect. For small, you have scattering on each different scatters essentially independently, and then you sum the effect in the probability, not in the amplitude. Because for very big wavelengths, you do not resolve different sources, different scatters inside. So that acts as a unique body. Okay, so you can say that the charge, which is actually responsible for scattering, is kind of smoothly uh, uh, distributed here. If lambda is very big. If lambda is small, then you are sensitive to small structures, and then scattering on different parts uh, is independent. Okay? So now coming to our example, what we have is the following. We have atoms which are composed of electrons and nuclei. And in the range which I have mentioned before, from keV scale to say 0.1 GeV, the corresponding lengths of the scatter of of particle which scatters is this waves is much bigger than the size of the nuclei and much smaller than the size of the atom. So we kind of in, in intermediate range. So this is lambda for 
for the range of uh, Q, which I have discussed. And therefore, scattering on nucleons, on a nucleons or protons inside the nuclear is coherent. And that produces factor Z squared. Scattering on electrons is incoherent because wavelengths is much smaller than the size of the atom and therefore a distance between uh, different electrons. And therefore, the scattering on electrons is incoherent and that leads to Z. So this is the origin of the factor Z uh, multiplied by Z plus 1 or Z squared plus Z. Now, of course, if you, go, if you further decrease lambda, so go to higher and higher energies, even scattering on protons inside the nuclear will be incoherent. And therefore, uh, Z squared will disappear. So what happens if you, I go to wavelengths which is much bigger than the size of the atom? How we can connect the, the two different parameters? Because this is the charge, z squared. Yes. And this is the um, number of. Z. Yeah, so z is number of protons. So right? It's not so the charge of. Z is the charge of new. Uh, uh, z is the charge of nuclei. And it is given by protons, number of protons. It does not have a unit of charge. So well, it's just number. So you may have, a, a, say, 100 or 120 or something like this, or have a, a 7 or 6, 14, 2, right? So that's, uh, then the atom is neutral, so then the number of electrons is also Z. You have Z protons and Z that electrons. Now, coming back to my question. So suppose I have wavelength which is even bigger than the size of the nucleon, which means that I'm going now to even lower energies than this key scale. So what, what will happen? Uh, no, here you will have zero. Because for so uh, big wavelengths, atom will be seen as neutral body. Okay. So yeah, it will be coherence, which actually kills all the effect, because you will have neutral atom and there is no scattering. Or if you have ions, yeah, of course, then it, it will be a given by uncompensated charge. Uh, so does this, does this mean, for example, for visible light, which is way bigger the length than the atom uh, radius, and if you have a charged body, if you shine visible light on it, yeah. uh, then the scattering response is, goes like n squared. Uncompensated. So if you have, you are speaking about ions, which means yes, that you have charge. number of uh, electrons which are s uh, smaller than than number of, uh, uh, of of protons. Then yeah, you will have coherent effect. It will be delta Z squared in this case. So does this mean that we have more powerful uh, light? If I think in terms of shining a light and reflecting it. But we are not talking about light, okay? Well, li light, you can, you can talk about light, yes. So, light is, uh, it, it is just on the border, because light is inverse of size of the of, uh, atom. Uh, yeah, if you go to lower energies uh, and you have ionized medium, and you really have ionized medium, then it will be coherent on scattering on uncompensated charge in atom. My focus uh, in this question is, uh, after a coherent response from a medium, are we extracting power from that medium by adding, by having that n squared uh, probabilities? Well, you will have more strong, I don't know what you, what do you mean by power, because you will have scattering, you will probably lose more energy <laughs> inversely. So we are discussing here energy loss, uh, you do not extract power, but the energy loss will be uh, increasing if you have coherent effect. Well, actually, one event happened just uh, last year. For the first time, people have observed coherent scattering of neutrinos on the nuclei. Of course, uh, 
And we have coherent scattering of photons or electrons. So this is routinely done from a long, long time ago. But for the first time, uh, 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 coherent scattering of neutrinos has been observed. And uh, that actually opens uh, uh, perspectives to have relatively small size detectors of neutrinos. So that active uh, study. Uh, now, so the only one for time being experiment observed this, this is in the United States. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the name of the experiment is coherent, exactly like. So that, that uh, something happens. And for neutrinos, of course, this is very non-trivial because interactions are very, very small in the first place. And to have coherence, you need to go to low energies. Remember, we derived the formula. And the uh, cross section is proportional to energy squared, which means that if you go to lower energy, uh, intensity of interaction decreases. So, so to have coherence, you need to have low energy. However, in the first place, cross section, elementary cross section also decreases with energy. By the way, notice the following in the exercise I gave. Uh, to you, you need to compute just numerically, you need to substitute parameters of cross section. In the cross-section expression in, in the exercises, there is additional factor one-third in comparison with what was uh, on, on the lectures. All right, so maybe I will not tell you why, but uh, so that's not accidental. This is not a uh, misprint and, uh, and uh, think about this. What, uh, now, probably uh, uh, you will not be able to do this because you need to know V minus A structure of interactions. Anyway. So this is related with anti-neutrino. For a neutrino, there is no factor one-third. For anti-neutrino, additional factor one-third appears in the cross-sections. And since we actually are discussing converse beta decay, for anti-neutrino, then I add this factor one-third. OK. So now let us discuss uh, ionization. So that was uh, for radiation. Now let me discuss ionization. And uh, 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 you will have exercises, and the problems uh, will be related to this energy loss. A couple of problems you need to compute. And can I ask a question about what we did? Yeah. Uh, when considering scattering of electrons, uh, are which distance actually we are taking as the T? This is this is comparable with uh, uh, radius of uh, of atom, which means Bohr magnitude. Uh, sorry, ra Bohr radius. Uh, because of the wave functions distribution. Uh, yeah, I think inside the nucleus. Yeah. Uh, so but here, what is important is even more important distance between different electrons. So if the distance between electrons is, uh, uh, is, is uh, bigger than wavelengths, then the scattering occurs independently. Now, yes, of course, uh, a wave function of electron, electrons are, uh, are distributed. So you, you want to say that okay, so electrons are everywhere. Yeah, this is a kind of more or less a classical picture, what, I was, what I, was, I was saying. But if you do this with wave functions, you will get the same answer. So when you talk about the neutrino, uh, yeah. coherent scattering, uh, we need to have the wavelength of neutrino or the D of neutrino. Are we shining something on neutrinos? No, 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 no. So that's a, a wavelength of neutrino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which means it's related to energy of neutrino. Like, like here is, uh, uh, okay, this is general consideration. I haven't specified. So you may apply it, this, the same arguments when you have, you, you scatter uh, electrons on something, and so then you should use. Uh, the energy of wavelengths of electron. Uh, if you use neutrinos, then you, you need to use energy of wavelengths of neutrinos. So ionization. So this process is just uh, uh, knocking of one of the electrons from the atoms by uh, 
scattering scattered particles. So you have particle X, which scatters. And then you have electrons in atom. And you knock one of these electrons from atom. So this is kind of a diagrammatic view of what's going on. So elementary process is X interacting with electron go to X plus electron and you have change change of of momentum of electron so it goes out of, of, of the atom. This is atomic electrons. So let me immediately give the formula for dE over dx, and then I will comment on this formula. So the formula has been derived by Pet and Bloch. And the expression is the following. It's 4 pi alpha square over me 1 over vx square. And then some factor, which is the function of me, velocity of the particle, and ionization potential. And that should be multiplied by the number of uh, electrons, uh, electron number density. So maybe I will not bother you with 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 uh, this formula. Um, well, it is uh, it has uh, logarithmic dependence on on uh, Lorentz factor, you know, so that kind of produces logarithmic increase. Uh, maybe I will still give it for just for completeness, but I will discuss some other factors. It's one half logarithm two mass of the electron square, Lorentz factor square, ionization potential square, uh, minus V square X minus delta gamma over over two and this is the electric screen. So let me gamma is one square root one minus V X square, which is Lorentz factor. Now Px is Px over Mx is velocity of particle. Uh, now I is ionization potential. And Me is mass of the electron. <coughs> the most important dependencies here is actually the one. The one is one over velocity of particle squared. So let me explain some factors here. Appearance of alpha square is clear, right? Because this is the second order process. We have two vertices in, in our diagram, which I have just deleted. So we have particle x, and uh, so then this is electron. Here, there are two vertices, so the amplitude is proportional to charge squared 
and therefore in probability we have this alpha squared. Now the most important dependence is 1 over vx squared. Which means that the slower the particle, the more chance it will knock electron from the atom. So that actually comes from the dependence on time particle um, crosses the atom. So the longer the time particle is moving inside the atom, the more chances for it to, to move uh, one of the electrons. Essentially this comes from from, the, from this dependence. And therefore, the time is uh, inversely proportional to velocity. We have this Vx squared. And this uh, 1 over Me is uh, uh, common for all possible particles, for all particles x. Let me give you some physics uh, inside into this formula. So we have such a formula. But the most important dependence here. And actually since V is given by P over Mx, so that factor is proportional to Mx squared over P squared. Right? So that's which means that for a given, for the same momentum, the heavier particle, the more it ionizes. And therefore, proton ionizes much more than electron for the same momentum. dE over dx can be written as average energy loss in a given co collision multiplied by sigma cross-section and multiply it by the number of electrons. So this average energy loss E is actually similar to Rydberg energy. If you remember, this is the energy needed to ionize uh, the atom from, from the deepest level. And it is given by alpha square mass of the electron over 2. Now, sigma can be written as pi Bohr radius, which is kind of natural, right? So cross-section, we do here this atom. Multiply it by opacity. We actually discussed this formula already before. Now Bohr magneton is one over alpha m p and opacity. is given by alpha square over V square. And this is what I have discussed. Of course, the stronger coupling, uh, strong, stronger interaction coupling, uh, less, uh, so more, the opacity is bigger. So you have more chance to interact. And this is one over V, what I have discussed, is uh, related to the time particle spans inside the, the atom. So if you collect everything, this cross-section, Bohr radius, Rydberg energy, and put everything here, you will get essentially all the factors of, of, of the formula, of better block formula. Sorry that I have kind of split everything. So you use this formula. And insert here Rydberg constant. 
then expression for cross section from here and use bore radius and uh, opacity and then you will get these factors. This is velocity of uh, ion or electron? Sorry? This uh, velocity is the velocity. This is velocity of uh, coming incoming particle. Mm -hmm. So it can be proton, it can be electron. The particle is actually our probe particle. Okay. Okay. So the index L and X means. Uh, so this is electron. This is electron mass. That's fixed. That's that comes from from this uh, bore radius or uh, other thing here. So we assume that this uh, throw electrons uh, No, no, this, this comes from uh, the fact that we are scattering on electrons. Ah, I ionized in this. Right, so that's that. And, uh, and, uh, and Mx and Px is incoming particles. So they have medium, right, these atoms and particles is coming. It has momentum, Px mass mx or mvx is velocity. Yeah. It is not like the incoming particle catches the electron. It doesn't, for example, it doesn't need to be a proton. No, it it's what, not like that. Well, this is different process, of course, right? So if you, have, you, you of course, you may have proton which actually moves into medium and captures and forms the atom. That's possible. So what, what I'm discussing is and we will discuss actually the particles with energies in MeV, GeV range, and of course they are too fast particles to form, so you need to have very slowly moving particle to capture. So that particles are moving here inside, and what they are doing, they knock or scatter electrons, and this requires that the electrons go out of atoms, ionize atoms. And of course particle loses the energy, right? So the particle X loses the energy. And uh, X can be whatever you want, charged particle. It can be electron, neon, proton. Okay. So now let me draw the uh, energy dependence or momentum dependence of this energy loss. And we will have exercise. So I would advise you just to put, collect all these formulas and uh, to check that you will reproduce in this way better block uh, factors, important factors. Dp over dx as function of momentum of particle has the following dependence. It's falling down and then logarithmic increases. Now this dependence just comes from 1 over v squared, which we have discussed, uh, which is given by the mass of the particle over momentum squared. So it's 1 over p squared. This here depends 1 over p squared. And it is approximately up to p equals to 3 masses of particle x. And then there is this logarithmic uh, increase which you have in the factor f. Remember, the formula contains the factor f, which has log logarithmic increase. Now, these are ionization energy losses. Radiation energy loss increases with, uh, with energy. Remember, it's proportional to energy, and therefore it has uh, such a behavior. And at some energy, um, it becomes bigger than ionization. So this is radiation. 
at lower energies, ionization dominates. Radiation becomes important at high energies. And uh, the point or momentum at which uh, the, they become equal is uh, um, called critical energy. So it's critical energy or critical momentum. At this point, uh, d, d, x, d over dx ionization equals dE over dx radiation. So this is critical energy. Energy condition. For electrons in lead, this critical energy is around 7 MeVs. So, lead and uh, for electron, EC is 7 MeVs. And let me recall that LR is 0.56 centimeter radiation length. <laughs> Let me give you some numerical example, and you will have uh, more in, in uh, an exercise. Suppose momentum of particle, so let me examples. Suppose momentum of particle is 300 MeVs. For electron, for this momentum, radiation dominates, right? <laughs> and the energy loss, dE over dx for electron, will be this uh, 300 MeVs divided over radiation length, which is 0.56 centimeters. And you will have 535 MeVs per centimeter. So that's uh, the energy loss of electron with such a moment. So, and for electron with 300 MeVs, we are sitting somewhere here, right? So this critical energy is 7 MeVs, so we are sitting somewhere far. <laughs> now for proton, you can now take the proton. I should write here electron explicitly, otherwise it's too many for electron. This is for electron. And for proton with energy, with momentum 300 MeVs, what we will have? We will have non-relativistic, and so this is, uh, this energy is proton, which is heavy particle. It sits on this uh, increase of uh, uh, ionization energy loss. So the dominant energy loss for proton is ionization. And ionization energy loss for proton, if you use a better block formula, is something like uh, 80 MeVs centimeters. So it's interesting for the momentum, which is like uh, 300 MeVs, electron will lose energy much, much faster than proton. So now let me summarize all these properties and uh, how we will use them for studies of uh, elementary particles and for discoveries of elementary particles. Question? Uh, they always both ionize and uh, radiate. 
on the... Yes, uh, uh, now we are going to uh, quantum nature, right? So you don't know a priori, so you, your particle enters medium and with certain probability it will both ionize and, uh, and uh, radiate. Now the question, what is more probable? Yes. So then you compute what is more probable. Uh, these quantities does not, uh, do not give the information which one is more probable and which one is more dangerous. Quantity. No, it, it, gives, it gives you precisely. So, so uh, for an uh, electron with this momentum, most probably it will pr uh, uh, radiate. Mm -hmm. With much higher probability it will radiate because this energy is much bigger than this critical one. Ionization probability is, uh, is much smaller. So, and of course, again, this is quantum nature. If you have many electrons, then you co can compute how many of them will you know, undergo radiation or will ionize something. Uh, but can you compare proton with electron with the same initial uh, energy? Yeah, so if one is more ionizing than the other, can we make it? Uh, in which sense we can compare? Uh, for, for example, human health is important to, uh, not to have ionizing. Yes. So, yeah. I would say that from these two numbers, uh, yeah. the protons are more ionizing. Well, it is more ionizing, however, the energy loss is, is smaller. I don't know what, what is better. <laughs> so it produces, uh, so it produces uh, uh, free electrons. But this guy produces gammas, which are also kind of not very healthy, I, I should say. <laughs> now, this is already biology. You can, you can ask what is, what is more dangerous. OK? So these characteristics which I'm writing, these are kind of average characteristics. You should also uh, remember this. Uh, for just a single particle, a priori, you cannot say what it will do, but if you have many particles, ensemble of particles, then you can say that say, 30 percent of these particles will do this one, so the ionize, and it's, uh, 70 percent will, will, will radiate. And this is especially, since we are doing here computation of energy loss, implies that it is kind of uh, not even single interaction, but many interactions with uh, some small portion of energy loss. So let me summarize and then to have put it in, in kind of in order. Radiation and uh, uh, ionization. So dE over dx radiation. This is ionization. So why it is important? Even now, so but if you do some phenomenology or particle physics, you will find some publications. And then you, by yourself, can actually try to do. So what, what some events, people are publishing some events. It's not even clear what is the origin of particle. Uh, but uh, knowing these features, you can do analysis by yourself. So radiation, the energy loss is proportional to P over mx squared for particle x, remember, right? So, so p is, is staying in front because the energy loss in a given, uh, so it is proportional to energy of the particle. And this mx comes from this uh, uh, acceleration argument, or deceleration. In the case of ionization, we have mx squared over p x squared, and then there's also factor uh, 1 over mv, just to have the same dimension. So you see here, dependence is opposite. In the case of ionization, the bigger mass of the particle, the stronger it ionizes. And uh, this, the bigger momentum, uh, this, uh, the smaller probability to ionize, in contrast to this situation. So here is Proportional to P, this is inversion proportional to P. So then, this decrease of P, this energy loss 
will decrease and this will increase. And uh, therefore, so if you see the track of the particle of the following form, I'm saying this in advance, but we will discuss this at length later. So if you see the track of the particle of this form, and you know that particle go from this direction, what does it mean? And usually the width of the track is proportional to energy loss. So this is why we are discussing this. So we are discussing tracks of the particles. And so when you see these tracks, this means that when particle loses the energy, its loss decreases. It, so it loses the energy and momentum. Momentum decreases and the energy loss decreases. So that track would kind of correspond to, to this energy loss when it's proportional to P. In the case of ionization, you would see the track of this form. So if particle moves in this direction. So particle loses the energy, momentum decreases, and energy loss increases. So therefore, when particle moves, and you see such a track, that corresponds to loss of the energy due to ionization. The smaller momentum, the bigger energy loss, therefore the more thick the track, you will see. And we will discuss how to uh, really see the tracks, how to visualize this. Now for the same momentum, and Speaking in advance, we can measure momentum independently on the mass of the particles using what? How we can determine momentum of the particle? Using magnetic field, right? So you use magnetic field, and I will discuss in the next lecture. In magnetic field, you will have the radius which doesn't depend on mass. You see? So, so that means that you can measure momentum and know what is, what is momentum of the particle. Then for the same momentum, the radiation, so let me put it in, I'm continuing this table. Radiation. Ionization. We have here dependence 1 over mx squared, and here is proportional to mx squared. Now, radiation is proportional to z squared, ionization is proportional to z. So we will use these features. These are actually our tools to, to, uh, to explore, to study particles. So since we have lunch today, right? So I want to finish early. Ask me questions, please. Here, the track, you say, is like the beam of the particles? No, no, just a single particle. A single. Uh, uh, so single particle, and we will discuss how to really visualize it. The track. So you will see some tracks, for instance, in some photo emulsions. You make a photo. This is for single particle. And you will see the track that it becomes thinner and thinner. So the width of the of this of, of the track is proportional to energy loss. So if you have very big energy loss, then the track is bold, you will see this. And if it is small energy loss, you will even probably not see the track, but you will see just some points on in photo emulsions. You may see something like this. Right, so you, you first have track, but then it becomes thinner, and then you have just something like this. So clearly, if you know that particle moves from this direction, this is the energy loss due to radiation. Once you know this, then you know how the energy loss depends on mass. And so this is the way how you can get information about the mass of the particle. Yeah? In the case of radiation, we have uh, um, a but that in my field, a magnetic field coming. But this in, in, in its own will, will affect the, the charged particles or, or if we have, uh, so it also will, will play a role in the, in the process. Um, I mean, because of no, for, you said. First of all, for time being, we have discussed, we have discussed some external magnetic fields 
uh, in, in this consideration. So all these energy losses due to uh, interactions of scattering on atoms uh, inside, the, inside the materials. Okay. Now, if you have some magnetic field, there are also energy loss, so-called synchrotron energy losses. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. Now, please ask me again. Sir, because I, I mean, the photon that, brought, uh, that come out from the, the scattering yeah. interaction, um, because it's, it's, it's a vibrating electric field, that magnetic field. Of what? Well, yeah, so it's the electron magnetic field. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so yeah, it yeah. also will, yeah. will, will make the, the, um, the particles that the particles themselves also radiate because of this interaction? Well, it may be if the energy is enough, but usually we have here uh, a, a emission of very soft, what we are saying, low energy photons. Essentially, they will hit medium so in, in this case. But yeah, if you have, a, 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 if you produce energetic, uh, energetic photon, it may further uh, ionize uh, medium or oh, ionize atoms yeah. or excite atoms. Does uh, this have something to do with uh, the higher orders of oscillator diagrams? Like we produce a photon after scattering, and the scattered photon may also interact with the. Well, usually they are quite separated. Well, in very rare cases, you will have an overlap, but usually you treat uh, uh, each of these processes independently. Independently. Yeah, in most of the cases. Okay. Oh, by the way, you, 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 you know, for instance, at LHC, the energies of particles are so high that uh, it's a problem to dump the particles and the energy in the beams. So, so, uh, so the energy is so big that they can melt, literally, the target. <laughs> so you accelerate these protons, but then you need to stop them at some point and. Uh, that's not trivial, actually. And the energies are really huge, you know, this energy is in the LHC beams. Okay, then see you tomorrow. Huh? So everybody has the program, right? I have, uh, you have enough copies because I have... Okay.